please, just wandering around, you know, checking out the furniture. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Patrick Lawrence. Is the sound a bit weird? Is it a bit too loud? It's very high tech. Is that a bit better? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm the CEO of First Step, and together with Nelly Katz Nelson, our fundraising and engagement manager, that's Nelly up in the back, uh, we organise these events twice a year. Uh, we call them thought leadership events, sort of fairly self explanatory title. Um, and it's delightful to see a lot of people back. Someone just said she doesn't miss them. Um, as in, she always comes to them because they're so good. Um, and uh, we're very happy to welcome you all here today. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on. Uh, same as the first step down the road, it's the Yalikat Bullock of the Boomerang. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and any Indigenous people who might be with us here tonight. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge people with the lived or living experience of mental illness or mental distress, uh, and also people with a lived or living experience of alcohol and other drug use. Uh, this is what tonight is all about, uh, and it is uh, without your partnership and your leadership through this reform period uh, that we all have great hopes and considerable fears about, um, we will not get where we're all trying to go. So you are very, very welcome here tonight. Um, I have a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, toilets are that way, out and around. This hallway here, there's an exit at either end. If uh, I catch fire or something like that, <laughs> get out in either direction. Uh, David is right up the back there with the camera. Um, we're also recording this and we put this on YouTube. Um, if you don't want to be photographed, can you please grab David at some point in time? He'll be he'll be wandering around and he will make a note. Um, put my old man glasses on. Mm, what are we going to write here? So uh, the purpose of these events is really just to give um, another forum, we're not the only forum of this nature, uh, to issues that are really on point and in the moment. Um, this is uh, our fifth, fourth event. The first one was online and we tackled uh, how integrated should the alcohol and other drug sector and mental health sectors be um, and had some very varied opinions from the panel. Um, and today, obviously, we are talking about uh, lived and living experience um, and the engagement consultation, which is a word that Mary hates, um, partnership, which is I think a word that Mary prefers, um, and leadership within our sector. So it's a, it's a great privilege to have this really quite amazing panel together uh, for this purpose. We know that we have a relatively sympathetic audience. Um, however, the panel has been instructed that if anyone disagrees with anyone, that that's okay. And we can uh, very much dig down into you know some of the areas where there might be a little point of difference. And of course, um, we are from what are essentially two separate sectors, but they are intertwining, AOD, and with them living experience is something there, and mental health, where it's something similar, something else. These guys are gonna work that out for you. Um, they will be assisted by Simon McKean, who's our regular MC for these events. And in order to not screw this bit up, I will read Simon's bio. Uh, Simon is the Chancellor of Monash University and was also the 2011 Australian of the Year. He's been with the Macquarie Group in a variety of senior roles for more than 35 years, including as Executive Chairman of the Melbourne's. He's a non-Executive Director of National Australia Bank and Rio Tinto Group and previously served as Chairman of AMP, CSIRO and MIOB. Uh, he's Chairman of the Greater South East Melbourne, an alliance of eight councils and shires representing more than 1.5 million residents. He's also the chair of the Australian Industry Energy Transitions Initiative, which comprises 18 of the largest Australian emitters who are collectively working towards becoming net zero by 2050. How's it going, Simon? Well, Butters has just made it a whole lot better. So. <laughs> okay, that'll, that'll be part two of the evening. We'll find out what Rod's, what Rod's doing to improve that. <laughs> he was also the chairman of the Federal Government's panel, which in 2013 completed a strategic review of health and medical research. I'll hand over to you, son. 
Thanks, Patrick. And um, look again, it's really wonderful to um, come along to these challenging conversations. I don't know terribly many other groups who have the courage to simply pick a topic, a tough one, insoluble, different views from experts and others. And typically, we don't have, at the end of the evening, a nice, tight answer to the problem, no. But these are the issues that Nellie and Patrick typically come up with indeed. When <coughs> I first heard that we were going to talk about the voice of lived experience, I, I only thought about it for a few seconds and said, yeah, it sounds okay, and didn't really think about it too much more. And then, and I heard a bit about it several days before you did, and um, as each day by, went by, I said to myself, yeah, this actually is a fascinating topic, and I say that from the perspective of a relatively ignorant person in this space, I'm certainly no expert, but the little I did know about it said to me, this is yet another really challenging topic for our community. In fact, I asked Nellie just a few minutes ago, you know, what's the process to come up with these topics, and it's quite a scientific one. Patrick and Nellie just sit down with a whiteboard, is that right, and it popped out. But I think you'll find over the next hour or so that, um, that it really is a challenging topic, but unless we work at it, we're never gonna make progress. We're never gonna make progress. As um, Patrick has said, look, one of the roles I have is Chancellor of Monash University. Don't worry, I don't lecture any of your kids or do any of the research in the labs, nothing special. I'm really just chairman of the board, go there every now and then, operate at 60,000 feet. But a university is, all about, as I said, learning and research. And um, every year I do, I probably conduct 18 or 20 graduation ceremonies. They're always very, very special occasions. Hundreds of typically, you know, 21, 22, 23 year olds coming along. Say a third of them or so are offshore students. They bring their families. And so often I can see that they're typically people, their families, who have never had anything to do with universities. Their kids are the very first opportunity that their family has had. And particularly when they come from overseas, they may have led relatively simple lives in China or whatever. First time overseas and they're coming to a graduation. And so often, and I think for the right reasons, we emphasise at these graduations that you know, it's a really big day, well done on all the work you've done, you've now got a key to a future which has all sorts of possibilities. We put them on a pedestal, if you like, because of the hard work they've done, the knowledge they've acquired, the wisdom, blah, 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 blah. But in thinking about this topic tonight, when Nellie and Patrick first delivered it to me, I kept thinking about the fine line between putting experts on a pedestal and saying, you know, over to you, solve our community's problems, and at the same time, shutting out the equally important issue, uh, contribution of lived experience. One thing in my CV that Patrick didn't read out is that I'm a dad, I'm part of a family. The usual sort of family that kind of, we sort of bred like rabbits and, and there have been a few separations and second marriages and what have you. And, and you know, I kind of find myself connected to I don't know, 30, 40 people. And not one, but a number of them have mental health issues, including some really close to me, really close to me. And I try not to say that with any sense of arrogance as if I don't have it, because I have my down moments as like anybody. But I have a number of people in my extended family that every day are doing it tough in the mental health space. And I hope that as the years have gone by, I've got a bit better at listening to the contribution that they can make to making progress for them and their own cohort of friends. Um, it's taken me a while, but I have learned that their contribution is just as important and occasionally a whole lot more important than the so-called expert that's been through the, um, the sausage factory and come out the end a 
so-called cleverer person. Anyway, that's what Patrick and um, Nelly have posed for tonight. And ever so briefly, the order of proceedings is that we will have uh, three wonderful speakers. Uh, Mary O'Hagan on my right, I'll fully introduce her in just a sec. And then uh, to my immediate left is Claire Davies and then John Caroga to the left who will be the third speaker. And after that, for those of you that have been here before, we'll have an opportunity for questions, challenges, disagreements, there's food at the back, some of that's occasionally thrown up here. No, that's not true. But nonetheless, hopefully a really interesting conversation where, where we all learn. And then most importantly, we'll conclude, it's supposed to conclude at eight o'clock, but sometimes it dribbles over a little bit. But then there's more opportunity after that to engage with any of the speakers or however you wish in, in smaller groups. So, um, so I think that's enough from me. And without further ado, I'd like to formally now introduce Mary O'Hagan. Mary was a key initiator of the psychiatric survival movement in New Zealand in the late 1980s and was the first chairperson of the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry in the early 90s. Mary has been an advisor to the UN and the World Health Organization, and she was a full-time mental health commissioner in New Zealand between 2000 and 2007. Mary established the International Social Enterprise Peer Zone, which provides peer support and resources for people with mental distress. She's written an award-winning memoir called Madness Made Me and was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2015. Mary is currently, and most importantly, the inaugural Executive Director of Lived Experience in the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division of the Department of Health in Victoria. All Mary's work has been driven by her quest for social justice for one of the most marginalised groups in our communities, as I'm sure I don't need to emphasise now. And so without further ado, Mary. say kia but I'm in the wrong country, so um, good evening everyone, uh, and uh, great to see you all here. Um, I just want to start off by talking a little bit about my own life experience, and a bit about what expertise uh, came to mean to me after being uh, spending about eight or nine years travelling through the mental health system uh, when I was really supposed to be at university. Uh, and um, what, what happened when I went through the mental health system is I, I went from being a relatively promising young citizen to a psychiatric patient. And uh, a career as a psychiatric patient uh, was gradually mapped out for me as I failed to respond to the pills and pillows treatment that I was given. Uh, and they began to lose hope for, for me. Uh, and um, during all that time, no one ever asked me what I thought of the treatment, I was guessing. Uh, no one ever thought that I had a view that was worth um, uh, asking about. And, um, but at the same time, I was learning a whole heap of things that none of my contemporaries who were finishing off the university uh, were learning. And yet, I was being characterised as the person who was missing out uh, because I couldn't uh, do the things that my peers uh, were doing, like getting career, getting a career, and um, you know, developing relationships and things like that. Uh, and yet, the uh, experience I had going through that system uh, was was by far and away one of the most instructive. Uh, periods of my life in terms of everything from uh, what you might call my uh, existential theory of knowledge uh, right through to a critique of the um, of the of the mental health system um, and and everything in between so so um, yeah, I developed quite a lot of expertise uh, during that time, expertise in surviving some pretty devastating internal experiences and surviving the huge drop in status that one 
uh, experiences when you go into that system. So, uh, of course, when I left that experience, I thought, bugger that, I'm not going to, you know, I think they need to hear from people like us. And so, um, I've been working on this project ever since, um, with this, and, uh, you know, maybe I have a foolish tenacity after 35 years, but uh, I'm still with it. So, um, so this, this forum, I think, is called Nothing About Us Without Us, um, How and Lived Experience Voices Incorporated at All Levels. And I just want to reflect on some of the language we use in this area. Um, now, some of you may have come across the IAP2 framework. Mm. You ever come across that? Yes. Um, and that outlines who are IAP2, International Association of Public something? Squared. Squared. Okay, <laughs> squared. Okay. Uh, and um, the, it outlines the public participation spectrum, which goes from inform at the low end. Uh, to consult, to involve, to collaborate, and then empower at the high end. Um, and it's really struck me uh, when I first came across this framework. Um, all that one of these verbs portrays the actions of a more powerful party, the public institution, that is, in determining the level of involvement or participation by the less powerful party, in this case the public, whoever they are, the great unwashed. Um, and the only exception is the verb collaborate, which implies a partnership, but all the other verbs um, are, are really just imply engagement um, as determined by the more powerful party. Um, and engagement is what public institutions decide to do with the public. Um, but partnerships are relationships between equals where decisions are negotiated from the start. Um, and, and also, I'm not against the word um, consultation at all, but the level of engagement that people want to have needs to be determined in the context of a partnership uh, between uh, the institution and the people it serves, uh, rather than the, the institution determining that. Uh, so, um, so there is a parallel with Indigenous people. Um, and for instance, in New Zealand uh, in 1840, the Māori chiefs um, uh, signed a treaty with the British Crown. And this treaty promised um, a partnership co-governance, but it also promised um, Māori self-determination and uh, their equal rights with with British subjects. Uh, now, um, in Australia, there's a, a debate about the voice referendum, which I, I um, don't claim to have a very nuanced understanding of, um, but I understand that the voice um, or advice of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people will be enshrined in the Constitution. Um, but I've heard that some Aboriginal um, activists are against the voice because they want a treaty first. Uh, and a treaty is about a partnership. And um, if I understand them correctly, um, I see their point. Why would we settle for an advisory role when you can have, have a partnership? So moving back to lived experience, expressions like voice, participation, involvement and engagement they're not really partnership expressions, and uh, partnership is where we need to be heading. So firstly, you know, how do we create partnerships with the people who use services? Things like open dialogue, supported decision making, shared decision making, positive risk taking, collaborative note taking, are just a few of the tools or models we can use. But it takes more than just uh, tools and models. It takes a huge mindset change away from um, clinical dominance, professional stigma, uh, psychiatric pessimism towards respect, human rights and dignity for people who have mental health and AOD issues. And that is the hard part. Anyone can invent a model uh, or a tool, 
Uh, but getting a whole system to change its mindset is incredibly difficult. So, um, uh, and really, I do believe that partnership, the people that really worry me in this whole uh, system are not people who are, who are working, you know, people's lived experience. It's, that it's not the people who are part of the workforce, so I have worries about what life's like for them sometimes. The people who really don't have any power in our system are the people who are trying to get into services or trying to get out of them or trying to be in them. Uh, and I don't think we think enough. I think we get caught up in leadership and uh, workforces and while they're important, we need to keep our, um, our focus on the people who really have the least power in our whole system and that is the people who are using services. So when I'm talking about partnership, uh, really the, the, a key area of partnership is how we relate to people who come into, into uh, services. Uh, but we also need to create partnerships through lived experience, workforce participation. Uh, uh, there's some really interesting work being done on lived experience governance frameworks. Um, as a kind of a, something, a reply to cl clinical governance frameworks, maybe to sit alongside them, maybe they can create a little bit of tension where we have a bit of uh, negotiation or dialogue. Um, and, uh, you know, we need people in senior executive teams, and I'm very heartened that um, uh, people's lived experience are starting in the mental health space, at least, to be in, uh, on executive leadership teams. That's really good. Um, uh, so the the Royal Commission did recognise the need for lived experience partnership and leadership when they said multiple times throughout that uh, incredibly long report uh, that that lived experience uh, people need to be um, uh, making decisions at the table on an equal basis with others and um, and really the the lived experience branch which uh, I'm the executive director for, was formed out of the Royal Commission, uh, a Royal Commission recommendation. Um, now, uh, we are one of eight branches in the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division, uh, and the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division is one of the divisions in the whole of the uh, health department. We have uh, 26 uh, FTEs at the moment, most of whom have lived experience or who are very reliable and trusted allies. Um, we, uh, we have three teams within there, one doing policy and lived experience workforce, another standing up the Royal Commission recommendations and an advisory hub that works across the whole division. Now the really interesting thing about the uh, lived experience branch, well we also have um, some AOD lived experience uh, people in the branch as well. Uh, so there is no equivalent um, of the lived experience branch anywhere in the world that we have um, come across. If someone can tell me there is, it would be great because we'll, we'll make contact with them and um, share our work. But um, so this is a really a world first uh, and when you think about 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you'd have lone people working in departments from a lived experience perspective. There was fairly, um, uh, many of those people came away from those experiences feeling pretty burnt. Feeling pretty burnt. Uh, and so there's a great thing about strength in numbers and we certainly have more numbers than we've ever had. So um, one of the key pieces of work we're doing is embarking on a mental health and AOD lived experience leadership strategy. And that includes leadership, partnership, and workforce development in, in lived experience. Um, we'll be, we'll be uh, doing the usual literature review <coughs> and analysis of that enormous report uh, to pull all the threads together to get a sense of shape about what the Royal Commission, the full extent of the Royal Commission's thinking in this area and what levers we can use. Um, we'll be going out and talking to the sector 
and uh, doing an environmental scan um, and getting people's uh, views. Uh, incredibly important to leave the department and go out, uh, which I've been starting to do lately. Um, uh, we're, we're going to be doing a vision for what, what we think this needs to look like in 2033, lived experience, leadership, partnership and, um, and uh, workforce, and then we'll be doing a strategy and implementation plan. And this is really an umbrella piece of work for our, our branch. Um, I think lived experience, leadership and partnership are the way of the future. Um, look, I, you know, I don't want to be too hard on clinical people. Um, I think they have a role to play, but the dominance of um, the clinical worldview has actually led to a system that has failed people's lived experience. It, it definitely failed me, uh, and it has failed a lot of other people. Not because, um, not because that worldview uh, is necessarily wrong, but because of the, it has been so dominant. Um, and uh, we need to work in an equal partnership, uh, as well as more lived experience-led services and supports. And the time is now. Uh, and there's never ever been a bigger opportunity in the history of Victoria or in, or in my whole career in different parts of the world. So let's seize the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Mary, for that very clear exposition. Finally, uh, John. John Caroga, for the past 24 years, John's practised as a social worker undertaking a variety of clinical training project and management roles, most of it in the alcohol and other drug sector. Since 2018, he has worked as an AOD health services planner, catchment-based planner, operating in Melbourne's north and west metropolitan region, working with a broad array of stakeholders to identify service gaps and treatment barriers, as well as practical strategies to address them. During this time, he has developed a keen interest in co-design approaches, working alongside consumers, practitioners, and others on various initiatives aimed at making the AOD treatment system more accessible, fit for purpose, and consumer friendly. And just before I hand over to John, John's our last speaker, and then you're the speakers, okay? So now's the time to start thinking about throwing those tough things at the panel comments rather than food, um, but anything else, and in particular, I know that uh, Patrick made very clear at the beginning, there, there are amongst us tonight, you know, people with what we are talking about, lived experience, and uh, I know Nellie's going to make sure that if there's any comments from any of you on that, we, we need to hear that, so John, you have the floor. Simon, look, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight about what we've been working on in AOD Health, state health planning space. Um, just before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So Simon mentioned, I'm a health service planner operating across North and West Metro Melbourne. I've been involved in that role for about five years. I guess um, one of the things, when I think about my role, I think of myself as an angry penguin. Um, people don't know, but Angry Penguins were a group of um, the social movement back in the 1930s. We were basically calling out all the social injustices. And so much of my time is agitating from the sidelines, frustrated things aren't what they should be. So, I've been in the sector for a long time, and over that time, I think there'll be general consensus that um, without consulting directly with consumers about their experiences navigating the sector, it's not only impossible to ensure that the service system is going to be fit for purpose. It just doesn't work. And it occurs to me that we, um, we don't spend anywhere near enough time dealing directly and valuing people's lived experience as a key source of information about how the service system needs to change. And what I want to be talking about tonight is a bit about some of our key learnings, particularly related to a project that I've been involved in for the past couple of years, 
referred to as the Consumer Participation with Experience Project, talking about what our experience has been on the ground. Um, Claire mentioned before, she mentioned a number of enablers and some barriers. We've actually had to confront some of those enablers and barriers. And whilst we've been able to present a case for reform, and there's been broad-based, in principle support for the recommendations that we've issued, um, our success rate in implementing those reforms has been, well, not great. And I'll talk a little bit about why. I'd say <coughs> agencies are very much constrained in many ways. There are limited opportunities for consumers to participate directly in service design, development, review and implementation. Now, it's very encouraging but I do think we're almost actually at a crest of a wave or there's momentum building, increased acknowledgement and recognition that we need to be working alongside community consumers in partnership, where there's a power sharing arrangement rather than dictating to consumers what we think that they need to be doing. I do think agencies are restricted in their capacity to, take, to obtain detailed qualitative information. In my job, I need to be consulting with a range of different stakeholders, whether they be uh, AD practitioners, allied health professionals, consumers. And when I use the term consumer, we're talking not only about service users, but also family members who've often been pushed to the sidelines. A range of different stakeholders about what they think is happening, what they see, but also what they think needs to change. Um, most of my time historically has been spent paying attention to things like service statistics, treatment data, whole population data drawn from the census and a range of other information sources. And don't get me wrong, that has its place and it's really valid. But if we only rely on the statistical side of things, we can't present a robust or comprehensive case for reform. We're missing half the picture. So when I came on board as a health services planner, what I wanted, one of the things I wanted to do was to prioritise consumer voices, elevate consumer voices within the treatment planning space, at least as it applies to North and West Metro Melbourne. And that's what we've been doing for the past couple of years. I would say, and I think there would be general agreement, that organisations have been effectively compelled, or they're fixated on KPIs. Are they meeting their targets? The funding and service arrangements are such that that's what they're basically focused on. They're compelled to be focused on that. And there isn't anywhere near enough time and attention paid to people's stories. And some of that information obviously is a lot more difficult to gather. It's a lot more resource intensive in many ways. And so what we're trying to do is to redress the balance. So with the Consumer Participation and Lived Experience Project that commenced back in February 2021, I remember having many, many, many discussions with people like Jane Morton from VADA. Just before we actually were able to implement it, COVID hit, so there are further delays. But as I mentioned before, the, 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 the aim and objective of the project is to elevate the consumer voice within the treatment planning process. How do we do that? So it's a partnership arrangement. We've got a range of different practitioners from various organisations that operate within North and West Metro Melbourne. So VADA, APOD, Family Drug Support, YSAS, Northwest Metro AB Service Uniting. There's a range of different representatives from those agencies working alongside consumers, some of which have been, they've all received training, so coaching into peer research training. So we undertake a series of consultations <laughs> with, with consumers. So we've, we've run a number of rounds of consultations with consumers, both service users and family members about their experiences. We then take that information, that data, we analyse the feedback, and then we put together a series of proposals and recommendations for change. Now, there are a few things that are, I think, features of the project itself. In this space, historically, consumer consultations have either been practitioner-led or researcher-led. What we wanted to do, we had a conscious effort that there would be a power sharing arrangement that we'd be working collaboratively with peer researchers. That a person's lived experience and knowledge was given as much weight as practitioner knowledge, as much as possible. I mean, ultimately, responsibility for the project um, lands on my shoulders and some other practitioners, but we would like as much as possible to step back 
And that's difficult for me because I've got a big mouth. <laughs> and I can talk a lot, give me a, a box and I'll stand there and talk for ages. But I need to consciously step back and encourage um, the peer researchers and the consumer participants involved in the project to come forward and to be involved um, in all operations of the project as well as the actual information gathering activity itself. So we set aside, we developed up a peer researcher model of training, all the decisions made about who specifically will be approaching to interview, that's a shared decision between the practitioners and the consumer advocates, or the consumer participants, sorry. The interview schedules, and the other consumer feedback tools that we use are all co-designed. Um, and as I said before, there's a shared responsibility in terms of the drafting of recommendations, putting those forward in the advocacy. All the consumers are paid for their time. That's one of the key um, priorities that we had, that we needed to value their contributions in a meaningful way. And so I've been working with um, three fantastic people as peer researchers who are wanting to add to the group of peer researchers later this year on a range of consultations that in broad, in broad terms we focus on consumer health literacy, referral pathways and entry points, help seeking behaviours, their views on treatment barriers and gaps in service provision and ultimately what they see as being important in terms of trying to improve the system, what works from their point of view. Now, I had a look at the feedback from the last couple of consultation rounds and I would say that most of the feedback that we've got, the key themes when we've done a thematic analysis of data, a lot of it isn't surprising. We've been talking about some of these issues for decades. For example, concern about the widespread difficulties consumers have in navigating the AD treatment system. Concern, one of the things that's been absolutely universal, every family member that we've actually consulted with, we've interviewed, have spoken about there being multiple times where they feel excluded or discriminated against. Mixed messaging about available AOD supports, which made service access more difficult. The need for a more holistic approach to AOD treatment and support. In many cases, I mean, this is not surprising for anybody, the people presenting to an AOD service have co-occurring needs, housing, mental health, financial, legal, and the list goes on and on and on. And then the other thing that's been really quite heartening is just about everybody has spoken about the importance of engaging with somebody with a lived experience. They have a credibility that someone with a clinical background doesn't necessarily carry. A sense of feeling more comfortable, not having to talk about certain things. They just feel more at ease when they know that this person has a lived experience. And in fact, when we do the consultations, the peer researchers take the lead in asking the questions and doing the interview. I step back which I'm happy to do. Now, there's broad consensus that enhancing consumer participation in the sector is important. The problem that I have is around the implementation. I would argue Victoria is the land of the pilot. <laughs> so many of the ideas have come, effectively, have become thought bubbles. And there hasn't been anywhere near enough attention paid to how do we actually implement these ideas so they're not only in place, but they're sustainable. And there have been more, far in my experience, there have been as many failures as there have been successes. I'd argue that consumer participation is still very much in its infancy. It's really promising what's happening. And I would suggest, if it's not in, in, in its infancy within the AD service system, it's um, in the process of establishing a strong foothold. And I think there's a real opportunity that's quite encouraging. Much more needs to be done. And we've identified three key themes. The first one, and absolutely critical, is that for consumer participation to be embedded, there needs to be de dedicated ongoing funding. It's got to be core activity. At the moment, and historically, for so many cases, there have been funding for short term periods, one year, two years. Fantastic initiatives are implemented, but when the funding dissipates, everything goes to the ether, it kind of disappears. There's, there's, it undermines that, un that, that, that long-standing legacy. Setting aside the fantastic work that's been done by Vinag, Shark and others, there in too many instances, it comes and goes. 
Secondly, we need to have much more attention paid to a dedicated consumer participation infrastructure. I'm happy to talk about what that might look like in the discussion, panel discussion. And then thirdly, an agreement around the standards and accepted interagency protocols that apply across the board. There are so many variations. That the best example that I can think of is the payment schedule. How do we pay consumers? How much do we pay, pay them? For what? For what sort of activity? There's a lot of variation that still needs to be sorted. I would argue when it comes to engaging consumers, there are a number of hard to reach populations where I would suggest that the AV service system has a pretty poor record when it comes to engaging them in a way that's sustainable and meaningful. Um, for quite a few years I was working at VADA and for about three or four years I worked on a program or a project that focused on how do we, how do we engage people from call communities and um, open up the opportunities for them to actually come into the system and I would suggest, for various reasons, we're not doing it particularly well. Often it comes down, comes down to things like um, short-term um, projects or initiatives. We raise the expectation of different consumer groups that we're really interested in hearing what they've got to say, but for various reasons we can't maintain that presence and establish a long-term relationship. So expectations are raised, we disappear, and they become quite angry. There's a sense of consultation fatigue and anger in some situations, and there is a residual credibility gap that then needs to be addressed. I mean, these are very broad brush strokes, but it's not the case in every situation, but it's a consistent theme. So I mentioned before, there've been mixed results when it comes to advocating for change. I think for the first round, we actually ended up putting forward six different recommendations. As I mentioned before, there was broad-based agreement, they're fantastic, however, they're very difficult to implement. One, there's no separate bucket of money to implement these ideas. Secondly, given the current situation with the reforms, there, are, there seems to be this ever-increasing pace of reform that people on the ground are really tired. There's a lot of fatigue, and I would suggest there are the lingering effects of COVID that are still um, at play. This raises serious questions about the sustainability of embedding any new cons consumer participation initiative. It doesn't mean it can't happen. And I'm actually really heartened by what I've heard in the past few months, but it's, it's, it's actually a difficult undertaking, you know? Um, I don't want to get caught up in the negatives, um, reform is possible and it is happening, but it's often incremental and pro continued progress is going to be sometimes at a slower pace than perhaps what I would like. Thank you. Thanks, John. Well, heard from a passionate campaigner, indeed an angry penguin. <laughs> And I've never really called anyone an angry penguin with a big mouth, but that's how John described himself. So, um, but thanks again for a third. Very, very clear message. You know, not enough time, not enough time to pay to just hearing people's stories and letting it sink in, working out where does that tell us that we should go. Mixed results when advocating for change. You know, perfectly realistic comment. We've had some successes, but not enough mixed. And um, boy, haven't we all felt in all sorts of different ways. But, you know, fatigue, COVID, an added layer to, to all of that. So, thank you, Mary, Claire, and John. Actually, Patrick, I reckon this is the first time we're pretty much on time. Yeah. What? Yeah, you're surprised, I'm surprised, nearly can't believe it. But that means that we have a good half hour without any time pressure to really challenge Joust with the three people behind me. So, oh wow, straight out of the blocks. We have, and, and can I just say, um, yeah. why don't you just, if you're happy, your name? My name's Zahi, and, and I'm a lawyer. Fantastic. And I come from a prosecution background and a defence background. Congratulate each and every one of you because I too am passionate about all three topics that you've spoken about. And um, I've 
listen to what you've got to say about lived in versus clinical, um, and that there's not enough lived in experience um, to combat issues of mental health and drug use and alcohol abuse. But I think we also, I think it's imperative that we all work as one, but it also comes from the top and that is education. We need to educate people in the judiciary. We need to educate people in the police force. We need to educate lawyers. We need to educate everyone that works in this sector. It's not just people that work in mental health. It's not just people that work in drug and alcohol. And it's not just me being a lawyer. I think there's a massive gap when it comes to educating the judiciary and their opinion about people that have got mental health issues um, and their opinion about people with drug and alcohol issues. I think we need to speak about the stigma that's associated with people that have got mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues, and the fact that they're judged and the fact that um, people, and I'm only speaking from my own experience, someone that's worked in the legal profession for over 25 years, on both sides, right, and now in family law as well, that and the LinkedIn experience of someone that has suffered from mental health issues as post-traumatic stress disorder, and my exposure to both there is trauma in the role that I've undertaken, um, we're judged and there's a stigma. And that stigma is what destroys a lot of the progress and the work that all three of you um, have put in and are speaking so passionately about. The fact is the people and the professions that are judging a lot of other people and sending people to jail or perhaps not giving people rights to their children because they've got drug and alcohol issues and they're judged as being not good parents, well, perhaps they need to look a bit closer at issues such as what led to the drug and alcohol abuse in the first place. And that whole stigma, and pardon my expression, that every drug and alcohol user is a junkie, or everyone that's got a mental health issue is nuts. We're not. I still practice law. I'm a passionate lawyer. I'm great at what I do. And I'm not nuts. My own peers judge me as nuts. My own peers would cross the road because I was the one that was brave enough to talk about mental health issues in my workplace. In workplaces such as law, um, crime, um, in areas such as the police girls, in areas such as psych, in areas such as your own and in social working, we're all exposed to vicarious trauma. I had to be brave enough to speak about that and I think stigma forms a big problem in the progress we're making. I think the lack of education in the judiciary, and these are the people that make big decisions in our community with people that have mental health issues, that have drug and alcohol issues. They're shunned. People are denied their children. So I'm very passionate about this. And I think education, is a big factor in making progress in this area. I think that it starts from the top as well. Um, perhaps a few more judges need to be appointed with lived in experience. Perhaps a lot more lawyers need lived in experience to be able and better prepared to deal with their clients. Um, I could speak about this forever and I'm very passionate about it and I'm not ashamed to say it, but I'm sick tired of the stigma and we're all human beings whether we're lawyers doctors clinicians whether we're people that have first-hand experience we're all people and it's about time that we treat everyone as people um, and it's not just about people that are adults what about children and why are they experienced drug and alcohol issues what are their lived in experience with their parents Etc. Etc. We could go on about it forever, guys. But it starts with education. It starts about speaking about it openly, 
and not being afraid to speak about it openly. And I congratulate all three of you for having the passion that you have in, in the fields that you work in. And I've worked a lot with Shana. And I take my hat off to the work that you guys do. And there's a lot of people that would be very lost without you guys and the drug and alcohol industry. And your story, Mary, touched my heart because I really related, related to you and the fact that you were listened to. Um, yeah, so that's my piece. And I think all three of you are really brave and I think the work you do is amazing. But as a community, we're all here because we're all passionate about what we believe in. And it's only through speaking about it openly and continuously speaking about it that we're going to get that message across that are in power. How often do police interpret um, mental health issues as someone being drug, drugged out or alcohol affected? Or how often are police, you know, just slamming people that are, have got drug, drug and alcohol issues into cells, letting them detox and not really taking care of these people in the cells? And how often are they left in cells for hours on end without any help or without being assessed. How many records of interviews have I heard where it's blatantly obvious that I can see the person's got mental health issues, yet yeah, no one's called the CAT team, no one's called forensic care to assess them. I could go on and on and on, but no, I've got a couple of be. questions in the back, so. Sure. But look, thank you. And, and I do want to say thank you, because if no one had put up their hand, I actually had a question based on exactly what you've been saying. I might get an opportunity a bit later on. But um, we've now had four speakers, okay? Three up here, <laughs> one down there, that's great. The interesting thing is that there's a heck of a lot of agreement, more agreement I would suggest than in our three previous nights. But I think there is still a quantity, I don't want an answer now because we've got two questions coming up very shortly. But, um, but I think the thing that we might disagree on is, okay, we're agreeing on where we are, but what's the solution to go forward? I mean, it's just been put to us. If we could change the mind of the judiciary, the health professionals, the health management, this, that, all the people with levers and power, then we might make some progress. But I haven't heard a whole lot of solutions yet about how we actually cut through. But let's just leave that for the moment. No, no, no. I've got to go down the back because there's at least two questions. You might have to shout. <laughs> um, hi, Linda. I'm from First Step. I am supporting the consumer, the Consumer Experience Consumer Group. Um, what the question I had was, um, I'm really curious, we talked a bit tonight about infrastructure. How do we start to care for the consumers that do join the workforce? And, um, and, and how are we looking at the infrastructure around I might take this one. Jim sounds a lot more intense, this microphone. Then it's a little around. Okay. Um, so there's a whole heap of work that's being done at the moment through the Department of Health um, as part of what's called the Workforce Development Project, Lived and Living Experience. I think there was how many millions? 40 over four, four years. 40 million over four years. Um, and there's a whole heap of work underway. So, but I can quickly sum it up for you. So, before you put anyone with a lived experience in a position, the actual organisation needs to be like ready. So, got some very well equipped people to answer this, but um, Shark, for instance, runs an organisational readiness program. Um, and there's other ones as well. I think probably that's is the best. But. Um, but really that's about readying organisations for what it means to have someone with a lived and living experience working working on your workforce or working from a you know, consumer engagement. But it really looks at what needs to occur for that to even start. And my colleagues could probably speak at length about this, but we're always surprised when we go and run that training, probably for more people than not that think they're ready to go or even worse, they've got someone with a lived and living experience that's already had a bad experience. 
um, and quite often the organisations are blown away by how little they knew. But why would they know? They've never done it before. So there's a lot of arrogance in this space that people just think, oh, it's just, an, you know, it's just a worker, we'll just get that worker in and it'll just work. But that never occurs with anything else. Like, so why would it do, why would it work like that with lived and living experience workforce? Like, you just don't go, oh, we'll just bring a nurse in, won't bother about changing any of the policies or won't bother about seeing what supports they need, just whack that nurse in. Like, that never happens. So it really is about being sort of thoughtful, you know, taking a step back and going, well, what do we need to do? There's great pieces of work out there um, that's, that's also in the mental health space that, that assists, so Louise Byrne, there's a whole lot of people that are doing a whole lot of great work. But there's some really um, tried and true steps that you've got to take. I, I could go on, but that's the first one. You don't start before you're ready. Um, I don't know anybody who's ready to undertake a role and through a process of spontaneous combustion, everything just falls into place. <laughs> I think there needs to be a range of uh, supports, um, wraparound supports for a person undertaking whether it be a peer role or a consumer representative type role. So for example, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is establishing a, a dedicated community of practice network within the North and West Metro region where it's aimed at increasing the pool of um, consumer representatives and part of that will be um, providing them with specific training that will underpin the sorts of activities that they may undertake in one or more treatment agencies across the, um, the various agencies and sitting alongside that is you know not only the training but possibly within those agencies themselves then possibly looking into offering things like um, peer reflection spaces <laughs> sort of buddying up systems or mentoring type models where they can sit back and in a very, this is not just as given. People can say, I feel I'm really easy, I'm, I'm, I'm easy to speak with and um, you know, I can accept criticism really, really well. It's all well and good saying that, but sometimes people need to test the waters a bit. So they need to feel safe that they are able to challenge and they're not gonna be put down or they're not going to be dismissed in any way. Um, in many the, the, the dealings that I've had with some consumer advocates is that early on they just needed to build up their level of confidence. They needed to test the water to see can I actually put forward an opinion and is it going to be truly valued? So they need to have certain systems in place that specifically deal with that. Um, the one thing that I noticed, I'll just say, that was related to that kind of issue is that so many of the consumers that we've spoken with have talking about spoken about they see other peer workers and other consumer advocates as role models. And one of the things that we need to be doing is adding to the career pathways into the service system. Because I would argue that people with a lived experience in some cases are an untapped resource. Not only does it benefit the, the service system, but effectively operates in some cases as a relapse prevention strategy. I mean, we know, if you understand the basics of humanity and the psychosocial development, people need a couple of things in their life. They need meaningful occupations of time, a reason to get up in the morning. And if people are unable to deal with the stigma and the discrimination, if they're locked out of so many different opportunities, that then of itself becomes a trigger for them to continue using. And so there's a range of things that, that, that need to be in place. And the good, thing, the good thing is some of that stuff is happening, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, big, it's a big ask. Thanks, John. Now, there was another one down at the back, and then I've got one on my left and another one on my left.
What's the low hanging fruit? How can we yeah, get some exactly. quick wins? Yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, one of the things that is perhaps missing in this part of the world is uh, an ongoing program to address stigma and discrimination uh, and I know that the National Mental Health Commission is working on a strategy at the moment, but I don't know who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it. That's the problem. Um, so I, th I think that's been very influential uh, in countries where it has, uh, these programs have happened. Uh, and I think they've been particularly influential uh, in the mental health space of that middle ground with depression and anxiety, I guess, if, or whatever you want to call these experiences. Um, it's always a bit harder to get a shift in attitude at uh, the more pointy end, where I was for a number of years. Um, but if I, if I look back um, to the beginning of the time I was working on this, I think there's been quite a lot of improvement in, in um, people's attitudes particularly in the, in the mental health area, and particularly in that middle ground. Um, when it comes to uh, the workforce, well, I've got a pretty simple strategy. I don't know if I'll be alive to see if it works or not, but that is to um, basically flood the workforce with people with lived experience and to, um, and to get them to be the agents of change within the system. Um, you know, imagine if we had a system where uh, a, a quarter to a third of people who worked in that system uh, had openly acknowledged lived experience, whether they were in designated roles or not. Um, that, that to me, uh, could be a very effective strategy for, um, for actually uh, bringing about culture change. Um, and it's uh, it's going to be um, <clears throat> very much at the forefront of uh, my mind as we go into this lived experience leadership strategy is, is how we can do this. It's complicated to get there, but I think uh, that's, that's probably the biggest lever we've got. Rolling now. There's uh, oh, there's yep. There's three in a row. Pink shirt and then pink shirt. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm a peer worker and I'm also been a peer work researcher on John's project. And I've spoken to my partner in a couple of roles. I'm trying to think how to roll my questions into one. I'm going to have a go. Just say all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about the difference between lived and living experience and the way that there's a stigma and a judgment made against people who are currently using drugs or currently well and how that's a really different place and how we, we're even talking about the idea of the treatment and lived experience and there being a stigma of having had used drugs. There's even more stigma about people who do use drugs, including living experience workers who use drugs. But I'm also thinking about the way that the clinical system shapes and, shapes and shifts the dynamic of what, what is in and out. The idea that using drugs is bad, the idea that hearing voices is bad, what is well and what is not well. I'm thinking about ideas about mad pride and I've got the code going on in my head as well. So thinking about those two things and also about how we value the voices of people who are excluded from services. Most people talk about people with lived experience. There's the living and then I would also say the voice that I think Mary was touching on is how, how much work and time and space needs to be put in to engage in and talking to people who are not able to engage with us what they need it doesn't exist at all, and how does the system interact with so many people in those communities? There's like three ideas at once. Tough question. Surprise, surprise, kid.
kid, it's a tough one. <laughs> um, one of the things that occurs to me is, in terms of um, gathering intelligence and gathering information, how we do that is absolutely critical. I think um, a peer-to-peer -peer based model is a much more effective way of gathering information. The reality is, off the top of my mind, people are currently injecting drug users. Um, within the AD service system, I don't think anywhere near enough attention is paid to them. And I think we've got to work through organisations like Harm Reduction Victoria. I do know that they understand they have a, a peer support network where they use those peers who are actively using to disseminate information, but to also use them and to work through them as a conduit to gather that information. Um, I don't think it's a, I think it's a really difficult undertaking. There are so many populations who are very difficult to reach. In many cases, I think they're the undiscovered country. I think about people with disabilities, people, older people, LGBTQI. There's a whole range of harder to reach populations that I don't think we can just adopt a, a one approach, one model that applies equally across the board. We need to um, engage members of those communities who will then have that credibility to engage other members of their community to seek out what needs to change. And then um, there needs to be attention paid to how do we actually demonstrate to them that we're taking seriously what they've put forward. I remember having a conversation with you and the other peer researchers earlier on when we, in the Consumer Participation with Experience Project around, we don't want to be raising expectations when we can't deliver. We can certainly put forward a case, you know, and sometimes a very, very strong case, but there are no guarantees that there's going to be follow through. And so we need to, at the, at the very beginning, highlight what we can achieve, but don't overpromise and don't say things are going to be delivered when they're not going to be delivered. Yeah, that's some things that come to mind. Thanks, Joel. Yep, um, now, next one is behind.
regards to the panel, I mean, I saw a lot of heads nodding. I saw a lot of heads nodding. Um, anyone got a response to oh, that? Itself? I don't know if I've got an actual response other than to say, like, I agree. I think um, privilege plays a major part. Like, I'd say that for most of us that are even in paid roles already, you know, um, that I'm aware of what I have as my privilege to just be here. And I'm aware there's a lot of people that do not have that. Um, and I think, um, you know, you can be someone that can access psychiatry, you know, through a, a private system and pretty much get what you need. Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole group of people that don't have that. Um, I think it is a part of the discussion that we need to have more thoroughly and it, it become more public, the discussion, because um, it's very real. I don't really have an answer as such other than just to say that. Yeah, perhaps the answer is, let's acknowledge the width, the, sorry, the breadth of what we're really talking about, because as I said, there were lots of nods. I'm gonna keep marching on. There's been a very patient lady and someone else wants to butt in as well. But uh, yeah, go for it. should answer that one because we don't have a private system where I come from. Is it is it the private AOD system or just private public services well, in general? If we're talking about, I mean, I worked specifically in AOD, so I'm just wondering about, you know, you talked about Marvel as well, but that's a bit. So, so, yeah, I'm just wondering about the partnership within the AOD system itself. There's not, look, I wouldn't say there's some partnerships. Um, I don't even really know how to answer that. I mean, I do. Do you want to have a go at that one? Within the publicly funded system, there are very um, stringent guidelines about how services operate. Uh, there are frameworks to high heaven. One of the concerns that I have with the private system is that um, there are quite a few shonky operators, to be perfectly blunt with you. I think as a starting point, they really need to focus on regulation. There needs to be some level of consistency across the board to ensure that um, agencies are independently evaluated and accredited and that there are commonly agreed to standards of care. Um, we've heard time and time again from various, um, only recently actually, the uh, focus group, I think it was last week, and one of, our, one of the participants mentioned that he'd gone to a private hospital and he was under the very strong impression that they were driven by the dollar and that there were limitations. He did say that the services were quite adequate, but then he compared that to what was going on when he went to a publicly funded long-term rehab. Um, there aren't enough beds in long-term rehab, there aren't enough resources put into um, publicly funded services. If there was more to be done when it comes to actually, if you like, public-private partnerships, to use that sort of uh, language, I think is a really good starting point. What the things that they really need to bend down and lock down is there are agreed to standards that are applicable across the board, irrespective of whether you source your funding from government or whether you source your funding from <coughs> philanthropics or other sources. I think that's something that they need to focus on. That's actually pretty cool. Can I add something to that? Yeah. So I just figured out what the question was. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I, um, the thing that I just want to say is that as long as there's not enough capacity in the public system, there'll be more and more private providers that pop up all the time. So, um, I think it's, um, some of them, some of them are right, some of them aren't. Um, but if you're desperate, and I know most of you know this, if you're desperate and you're in the community, you'll do whatever you need to do to get the help you need. And I know we speak to a lot of um, families, particularly, that just want support and need help for their loved one. And they'll do anything that they can do to help that person. Um, and they're not, you know, people will say, oh, you need to read the fine print and all that. If you're being traumatised by someone in your family, you just want help.
all to them, you're not going to be reading fine print. You're not going to be doing any of those sorts of things. You're just going to try and get them help. So it's it's a real problem. And yeah, the public system just needs to be larger. Now, talking about large problems, we have lots of hands and it's gone past eight o'clock. I've got to go right down the back, Nelly. You've got someone right down the back and then we've got to shoot over here to the green t-shirt. Hi, Nelly. I have a question. Sorry, I missed the last bit. I don't really have a question. No, that's great. No, 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 no. You, thanks for your courage and honesty. Thank you. Please. Um, yep. So my name's Luke Anderson. Uh, I was invited here by my what tonight. I was 100 percent sure what what my purpose was for being in the room, but um, it's very apparent to me now. So I um, have completed four and a half year prison sentence. Uh, grew up in a housing commission. A lot of really typical elements to my story uh, that led to my incarceration. <coughs> I ended up engaging heavily with um, counselling and then AOD services as well to help turn my life around. Came up with a bit of a cool business idea that's around uh, like increasing accessibility to uh, clothing and other items for the friends and family of inmates to be able to purchase them and have them sent directly into prisons. So my story has become uh, quite appealing for Corrections Victoria and they're starting to develop quite an appetite for this lived experience topic. But um, most recently, which was last Wednesday, I was engaged by the GEO group to go in and, and talk to 130 inmates within the walls of the prison. Uh, they paid me to do it and I thought that was a fantastic step in the right direction. But because I am a bit of a pioneer in this space, there wasn't any sort of support, and I'm glad it was me that went did it, but um, so I was on the Wednesday. Uh, I couldn't really sleep Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and I can speak all the time, um, and I do it quite well. But this one really, really uh, rattled me. And then once I got into the prison, I spoke to mainstream prisoners, which was fine. Um, so people with what you would consider typical sort of um, uh, 
offences, and then uh, they told me that I'd be then speaking to protection prisoners, of which about 85 to 90 percent uh, were in for sexual offences. And part of my story is that my family was impacted by um, sexual offences, which helped to contribute to my offending behaviour. So that had a, a really strong impact on me. I was able to get through it, but leaving uh, the prison walls after that, I was sort of starting to think, okay, if we really want to take a lot of steps in the right direction, um, we do need to engage with the lived experience correctly and then you, you have helped me to articulate it a little bit better now with some of the things that you've said, but um, I'm really worried about the fact that everybody can see the benefit of engaging with lived experience but not necessarily having a really good comprehension of how that can impact the individual. Is there, yeah. is there any uh, model or any proposed model that anybody has at the moment that, or any sort of data or research that you know of that could help me um, when I do start to engage in conversations with Corrections Victoria to create a, a really practical and sustainable model to be able to set up um, for people within prison and, and then support post, post release because there is a lot of uh, overlap in yeah. these areas. Thanks, Luke. What a question. You probably need to talk to that guy sitting next to you in the checkered shirt later. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that. And um, there's, a, there's multiple bits of what you just said that I'd love to speak with. I think I'll, I'll go with the bit about the toll that this can take, um, talking about yourself uh, or using your own lived experience in different formats and forums. It's not spoken about a lot, but it is spoken about from people that have been in advocacy roles for a really long time, the toll that this can take. When you have wins, but when you have losses, but then just in, during the day to day and the work that you do, um, there is, there's a whole heap of stuff that we can support you with um, at Shark and we can get you in contact with all sorts of other people as well. I think um, the, the reality of the work is though is that a bit like what I was talking about with the relational infrastructure, it's, it's about making sure that anyone that's going out there and doing what you do, you've got all that, um, you've got all the padding in place, you've got all the support and there's heaps of different stuff and it can also be quite individual. What will work for you won't work for somebody else. Um, like for me, for instance, tonight, I know I've, I've made sure I've got some familiar faces in the audience. So if this went to shit, I've got like someone that I can look at and go, I've got some love coming from over that way. So that's good. Because it is a lot talking about, you know, who you are at your core, really. And um, a, lot of, a lot of what we talk about from the lived and living experience space is we're talking about who we are in, at our essence. And that's not stuff that you tend to talk about a lot with people just, you know, over a coffee or when you're dropping your kids off at school. Um, it's, a, it's a different place that you're coming from. Um, but there's a lot of, it just sounds amazing what you're doing. Um, Shark Shark has a peer mentors in justice program where we have peers that go into the court system to support, but it's, it's a lot of different people doing it, not just one out. Um, but we'd love to talk to you, but it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot of infrastructure you can put in place. And like what I said before, it's about making sure the places that you're going into are first and foremost ready. Um, and they know what they're asking of you to do. They know how to support their already, the workforce that's already there with what to do. Um, there's lots of different components to it. And there's definitely research as well that we can make sure you get. Good on you. Yeah. Can, can I, I just say, they should never talk to the protectors and prisoners. Yeah. It's just not right. I, I will yeah. say um, that, that, and this is the importance of lived experience, that I hold absolutely no resentment towards the GAO group for not identifying that because no, I'm not this is, um, yeah, they definitely shouldn't have, but yeah. um, they can only learn that by being brave and engaging with lived experience and now they're going to know from here not to do that. So I think it's really important not to really go. I'm not going, going in. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah. But I think that underscores what we're talking about tonight, namely, there's a desire right throughout this room, and has been since the first speaker spoke, about the importance of taking this area far more seriously than the whole community does. And um, I think we're all approaching it from slightly different perspectives as to how we cut through and make it an absolutely not acceptable, but fundamentally important part of you know, the whole mosaic that's required to make progress. Um, did you want to have one more? Sorry, just for yeah. but I think um, um, someone utilising their lived experience and being so open about their experience, um, it's, it's a form of risk taking. I think it's not always a given that it's going to be a receptive audience or even an environment which is not hostile. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, I think there needs to be some thinking about how do you protect yourself and how do you make sure that you're given enough support before, during and after with be debriefing and those other things. It's time for me to make myself the most unpopular person in the room. I know there's, there's lots of people that try to put their hands up, but I am going to draw a line at this one. I know one or two actually do have to leave, but before I go any further, can you please join and thank Mary and Claire and <laughs> Leading against the goalposts, uh, the <laughs> Patrick. Patrick, next time, can you bring a keyboard? Can we start off at night uh, with it? Uh -uh. Because he's a talented pianist, a super talented pianist. For those of you who haven't had the privilege of listening to him, so we're going to kick it off in a different way. But thank you, Patrick, for what you've done. Yeah. the sun go down and blinding you for 10 minutes until Patrick put the blinds down. But uh, thank you to Lord Summers and Powerhouse for, for this venue and our photographer who is still clicking down the back there, David, thanks for all you've done. And can you give yourselves a huge round of applause, go on. <laughs> the final thing I want to say is that you know, as is always the case, Nellie's got this beautiful running sheet, you know, minute by minute by minute, which we largely stuck to. And the very last item, I don't know what it means, but it just says schmoozy, Nellie. I think that means that it's all over to you. But, um, well, thank you very much. It's been a really, really great night.